Good morning. Uh, the, the session of today will be a very, very brief presentation for all potential investors who want to do business in Italy. Now we start talking about the tax resident. So a company is resident in Italy for tax purposes. If it's a legal seat or the place of effective management or the main business activity is in Italy for the greater parts of the tax period, it means more than usually 183 days. All the resident companies are taxed in Italy on their worldwide income. The non-resident company will be taxed in Italy only on Italian source income. We can introduce the main direct corporate taxes. The most relevant uh, is the corporate income tax, is IRES, whose rate is 27.5%. For certain activities, for certain business, uh, I'm referring to, especially to the energy industry, the tax rate is higher 38% uh, is, so, is called revenue tax. Always with respect to IRES, there are specific rules for IFRS or IAS adopter. So keep in mind if you use this specific accounting principle, there are very, very specific rules for these uh, operators. The second relevant corporate income tax can be considered a, a local income tax, more precisely a regional tax. It's called IRAP. The literal translation is regional tax on productive activities. And the rate can range from a minimum of 3.9% to a maximum of about 4.8%. Keep in mind, because this is very, very important in order to understand the whole tax burden of Italian companies, that the taxable basis of the two taxes are different. Now we can also talk about another tax which was introduced in 2012. IMU uh, or IMU is a tax on the real property and all the property owners are liable for this property tax on all lands and buildings. The rate can vary from a minimum of 0.3% to a maximum of 0.76% and this tax will be applied to the taxable value of the property. Now we will introduce the value added tax, so called in Italy IVA. It is a general tax that applies in principle to all general activities involving the production and distribution of goods and the provision of services. It is a consumption tax. It means that the burden of this tax it is, born, is born ultimately by the final consumer, not by the entrepreneurs or the corporation. So it is not definitely a charge on, a business, on the businesses. How does it work? It is collected fractionally. So basically the entrepreneurs will deduct from the VAT that they have collected the amount of the tax that they have paid to other taxable person on the purchases for their business activity. The standard rate is 21%, but keep in mind that uh, there is the possibility that the rate will be increased starting from October uh, 2012. There are other rates, reduced rates for certain um, production of goods or certain provision of services uh, which are basically 4 and 10 percent. For certain activities um, there, there are VAT exemptions. I'm referring especially to all financial services, medical services, export and sales and contribution of assets to a company. Now explain briefly the taxable basis. With respect to IRES, the taxable income of a resident company for this specific purpose is, is business income, so which is the net income earned in the, in the financial period, more precisely in the tax period. This profit and loss must be adjusted, this result must be adjusted on the basis of certain rules, but 
the, the, the starting point is represented by the profit and loss of the, of the company. The second corporate income tax, the local income tax, ERAP, is calculated on a different taxable income, a different value, uh, which is represented by the so-called net added value. And uh, now we can briefly uh, yeah, explain the, the concept of net added value. It is basically represented by the value of the production minus some cost of production, which is really, really important to be remarked, is that certain costs are not relevant. I'm referring to employment cost, excluding social contribution, the extraordinary and financial components. Now, we will explain some important regime that every investor must know if he wants to operate in Italy, if he wants to run a business in Italy. First of all, we need to discuss about the tax losses. The tax losses starting from 2012 can be carried forward without time limitation. But keep in mind that only 80% of the current net income can be set off against prior tax losses. There is a specific tax exemption exception for this rule and it applies to the tax losses incurred in the first three tax periods. In Italy there are no change of ownership rules applying to the tax losses carried forward except when there is a substantial change in the activities. Carry back of tax losses is not allowed. Like other European jurisdictions, in Italy there is a specific participation exemption regime. It means that an important part of dividend and capital gain on shared sales will be exempted. More precisely, 95% of dividends and capital gains are exempt. But there are exemptions, in particular, this rule is not applicable to capital gain and dividends deriving from blacklisted jurisdictions. Another important regime is fiscal unity. So in Italy, if you have more than uh, more corporation, you can consolidate the net income. So it means that you can set off negative and positive taxable incomes. Now it's time to talk about anti-avoidance rules and uh, these restrictions must be strongly kept in mind because are, are very, very relevant. So we have thin capitalization rules. So what does it mean? It means that the interest, the borrowing expenses incurred can be deducted only within a certain limit. There are specific transfer pricing rules, so it means that if there are intercompany transactions, we need to comply with the so-called arm's length principle. There are also CFC rules. And on top of that, there are also very, very specific anti-avoidance rules concerning certain transactions. Um, but, but I think that it's, it's a very, very important to, to remark that in Italy there is a great focus on transaction with blacklisted jurisdictions. So if your company buys, uh, purchases goods or services from supplies located in blacklisted jurisdictions, you need to put in place certain fulfillment and uh, you need to be quite cautious. And uh, last but not least, there is also a general principle elaborated by the Italian Tax Supreme Court on the anti-abuse law. So keep in mind that like in other European, not only European but also Western, generally speaking, jurisdiction, there is a great focus on anti-avoidance rules. The last part of this session is dedicated to incentive. And if we talk about incentives, you must be aware that as Italy is part of the European Union, there are certain rules to 
be compliant. But if you enjoy specific incentives and these incentives are lower than 200,000 euros over a period of three years, uh, there are no limits. But if the amount is higher and these incentives are based on the location and the size of the business, you have to comply with EU rules. Second important point is represented by R&D tax credit. This tax credit is allowed to companies which outsource R&D activities and development activities to research centers, to research bodies recognized by European Union, to universities, and the amount of this tax credit is quite relevant. The last incentive that we, we discussed today is the so-called ACE, that can be translated as a support to economic growth. From 2011, resident company and permanent establishment of non-resident company can enjoy this notional interest, which is a further deduction that must be calculated on the increase of the net equity. For the first three years, the rate of this notional deduction, of this notional interest, will be 3%. Thanks for the attention.